Playing with older Enterprise GPUs has become somewhat of a hallmark for me here on the channel. But what do you say we jump back into the modern era, turn on RTX, say goodbye to every dollar I've ever had, and say hello to the NVIDIA RTX A16. Hello. Server room, this is the captain. Rhett, is there something going on down there I need to know about? Ah! We're on UPS backup, sir! The main paradigm couplers have come on a line! Uh, the tachyon routers are tangled with the secondary gazon In router. English, Mr. Rhett? It's the bandwidth, sir! Getting it down's not the problem, it's getting it back up! Well, do what you can, but remember, I've got a budget here. I'm gonna have to call you back. Hosting your own servers also means you get to host all your own problems. Even the most skilled chief engineers will tell you you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. They offer shared CPU plans for as little as $5 per month and can scale as high as you need to go with dedicated CPUs, S3 compatible object storage, GPU hosting, NVMe block storage, and more. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craftcomputing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craftcomputing, and again, thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. On the table next to me is probably one of the most expensive pieces of tech I have ever had my hands on. And that's definitely saying something. My server rack is filled with multi-thousand dollar Xeon and Epic CPUs, enterprise GPUs and motherboards, and the rack itself was probably worth something at some point too. But most of these parts are washed up has-beens. Sure, my Xeon 2698V3s debuted at $3,200 each, and the Tesla M60 ran about $6,000 new. But now both of those can be had for less than $200 each. But this, this is something special. This is the NVIDIA RTX A16, and it's an Ampere-based GPU designed specifically for what I do best, NVIDIA Grid and VDI. Calling it a single GPU is a bit of a misnomer as well, as it's not just one GPU, but four individual GPUs on the same PCB. Built using the GA107 GPU dies, it actually shares its soul with the RTX 3050 four gigabyte cards, though these GPU dies are significantly cut down from their retail counterpart. Instead of 2300 CUDA cores on the RTX 3050, the A16 GPUs only have 1280 CUDA cores enabled. GPU boost clocks are roughly the same at around 1700 MHz, but the memory is clocked slightly higher at 1812. The memory though, let's just say this is where Nvidia starts to justify the $9,000 price tag of the A16, with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6X ECC per GPU. That's 64 gigabytes of video memory on this single card. While this all may sound pretty bizarre, having a card with a ton of memory and four GPUs on board, it's actually a formula Nvidia has used many times before with some pretty great success. One card you may have seen on the channel before with a nearly identical layout is the Grid M40, with four GM107 GPUs, each with four gigabytes of video memory. There's also a couple much older cards in the Kepler family, the Grid K1 and the Grid K340 that also incorporate four GPUs onto a single card, specifically for VDI and distributed computing. So why this design? Would these cut down GT740, GTX 950, or RTX 3050 cards even have enough power to drive 3D games? Well, no, at least not to the level that you might expect out of a card that costs between five and $10,000 each. Instead of 60 FPS in GTA 5, cards like this are designed to run smooth desktop experiences, NVE and CD coding for watching videos online, and some light 2D and 3D acceleration in professional applications. The high amount of video memory allows each GPU on the A16 to be split into 16 one gigabyte VDI sessions, rendering up to 64 desktops off a single card. For organizations looking to deploy remote work solutions for their employees, the A16 would make an incredibly dense solution, all while reducing costs of mobile devices and ensuring your internal data stays internal, as no files would actually be sent off-site to the client, 
just a video feed of their desktop session. Of course, that's all well and good, but you know I'm still going to try to play games on it. Out of the gate, Borderlands 3 shows us that not all Ampere GPUs are created equal. In fact, with only 1280 CUDA cores and 63 watts of available power, they can be downright bad. We see an average of 35 FPS with both the 1 and 0.1% lows into the single digits. I haven't been this disappointed in a GPU since my ATI 2400 HD. Moving on to Doom Eternal, we get back on the right track with 60 FPS on average and a 1% low of just 48. Cards like the A16 are always interesting to study, as gaming performance can vary wildly because of the low clock speeds, power limits, and lack of physical CUDA cores. Remember, this has barely half of the physical specs of the RTX 3050 mobile GPU, but still cruises at 60 FPS here while getting flat out embarrassed in Borderlands 3. GTA 5 also shows some very impressive results, averaging 60 FPS with lows staying well above 35. Again, the game is very playable, even streamed over the network through Parsec. And the NVENC H265 encoder is markedly better than the Maxwell and Pascal cards that I've tested in the past, leading to a clearer stream with less artifacts. So, decent performance overall, and definitely some headroom to increase the average FPS above 60 if VSync were disabled. But remember, using vGPU profiles with no modifications, we have a hard cap at 60. Unfortunately, these tests also showed that GPU utilization was around 80% in Doom and GTA 5 both, and power draw was between 55 and 60 watts, meaning further dividing the GPU power to other VMs would cripple any hope of 1080p gaming. I did attempt to launch Cyberpunk 2077 to demonstrate a title with ray tracing, but let's just say it didn't go so well. Even at the RTX low preset, we saw frame rates struggle to stay above 20 FPS. Disabling RTX but staying at high settings showed a similar result. It wasn't until I dropped to 1080p low settings that the game was even remotely playable, averaging just 40 frames per second. Now, to be clear, I was not expecting fantastic results from this card, even after the mind-blowing performance I saw on the Tesla P4 that I reviewed just a couple weeks ago. That was a low-watt, small form factor card with 8GB of video memory, but was also based on much higher bin silicon and had twice as many CUDA cores as the A16. If you're interested in taking a look at that video, I'll have it linked down in the video description. The A16 is limited to just 63 watts on each GPU, for a total power limit of 250 watts on the card as a whole. And as we learned in the P4 video, it's the number of CUDA cores that matters much more than how much power you're pushing through them. What I'm trying to say is, don't think of this card like a supercar. It's more of a city bus capable of getting 64 people at a time to where they need to go. Eventually. As one final test, I also ran 3D Mark Time Spy, just to get an idea of relative performance to consumer GPUs. And the results were, again, slightly disappointing. Comparing to all of my previous scores, the A16 lands somewhere between the 1050 Ti and the RX 470D. I can't say that I'm surprised by that result, as I'm sure the 63 watt TDP is holding the A16 back pretty hard. But well, just look at my Tesla P4 benchmark from before, where I was able to run two instances of GTA 5 with the same 60 FPS on average, but slightly lower lows of just 24 FPS, all while drawing the same 60 watts of power. So then, after all that is said, I couldn't possibly recommend the RTX A16, could I? Well, not so fast. Let's consider that 1080p gaming is not its target market. The A16 is a GPU that follows in a long line of successful VDI supporting cards, and for its intended use case, it's definitely a compelling value. As I mentioned in my VDI video, the A16 could enable remote video editors to scrub through footage without transferring hundreds of gigabytes of video files to their laptops. It could render 3D models for design teams and mechanical engineers. Is the A16 a graphical powerhouse? Of course it's not. In fact, a single RTX 3080 or RTX A5000 would easily run circles around it, even when running eight or more simultaneous virtual machines. But the A16 does exactly what it sets out to do. It allows businesses to distribute GPU accelerated instances to remote workers and replaces the need for $2,000 workstation class laptops with things as simple as iPads or Chromebooks all the while providing local access to other vital resources on a corporate network without the risk of data leaving the premises. 
Before I go, a huge shout out to the individual who loaned me this A16 for review. You know who you are. Also, full disclosure, this is not a sponsored video of any kind. No money changed hands, no companies at all were involved in its production, and my opinions are 100% my own. The card will, unfortunately, be returning to its rightful owner last week, and I will admit, I'm a bit sad to see it go. This RTX A16 was manufactured by PNY, and if you're interested in this exact card, I will leave links down in the video description to where you can find one for yourself or more realistically, your organization. On your way down there, drop this video a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and leave me a comment letting me know if there's anything that I missed in this video that you'd like to see covered when it comes to VDI or remote GPU acceleration. I'm always looking for new use cases to cover when it comes to this technology. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. I need to drink more wine in the show. Today, I am drinking Canar out of a Canar bottle. Actually, any Star Trek fans will recognize this immediately. But what this is, is from Star Trek Wines and Spirits. You can find them online at StarTrekWines.com. Uh, this is not sponsored. This is something I bought probably close to a year ago and have had on my shelf for about six months or so. Uh, this is supposed to be inspired by Cardassian Canar, which is a liqueur that is a favorite among the Cardassian elite. And I have to say, I think they nailed it. So I had this on the show this last Wednesday, by the way, Talking Heads, soon and every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic dessert wine. Uh, very reminiscent of a really, really thick port, but it's not syrupy at all. It's incredibly sweet right off the bat. It's very thick bodied. It leaves you with just this ever slight oakiness and then just kind of vanishes. It doesn't coat your mouth. It doesn't leave you kind of sticky or oily or anything like that. It's just an all around fantastically balanced wine. If you are a wine drinker and I'm not much of one, I would definitely consider picking this up. Although be warned, it was $60 a bottle. I really need to drink more wine on the show. This is fantastic.